ability to have their own means of production. So mm. that sounds communism, but communism is the state controls the means of production. Distributism is the vast majority of each individual person controls the means of production. So one way to think about it would be – or a modern way to think about it would be a freelance economy. Yeah. So for example, my wife who's a designer, she has – she can very easily – or she has a, the – capacity to control her own financial destiny because she owns the tools that she needs to to work her computer and also she has skills that she learned in school i've got the same thing with my dj business exactly but she can leave her job if she wants to and go and make a living off the sweat of her own brow as sort of the small business or as this almost as this individual freelancer the old model would be an agrarian society where every person had two acres and they had enough uh, Chesterton said distributism is two acres and a cow. That, that was what he said. <laughs> two acres and a cow for everybody. You that, guys don't have that? <laughs> Sorry. Um, that if you, you could sort of um, – man is more free when he has the ability to um, take care of his own needs as much as possible. And whereas private property is distributed amongst the vast majority of amount of people as opposed to capitalism where private property and the means of production is controlled by the wealthy few right. and communism where it's controlled by the state or socialism where it's controlled by the state. So they hold up um, the Middle Ages as a model and an experiment of distributism, especially it was held by monasteries. So these monasteries had taken vows of poverty and they they owned a lot of the land, but because they had taken vows of poverty, they let people use the land f- for their own benefit and then they had to pay a little bit to the monastery as a tithe as like a rent uh, of the of the tools and a rent of the thing and then that whole thing came crumbling down when henry the eighth um, took all the monastery land held it to the crown and distributed it to uh, the nobles mm. well and there was, was also sort of a little like bit first. of corrupt stuff going on with the monastery oh, for sure and that's one of the for reasons sure, for he sure, took for it sure, is for the sure. monasteries were taking too much money um, and the the abbots were these incredibly wealthy individuals yes, because the, they were the, taxing but too much for uh, for the peasant um, the corruption of the state tra- well trumped the corruption of the monasteries because now you had these noble lords, uh, some of who owned uh, – which became the House of Lords in England. Some of these noble lords owned like you know, 30 percent of all working farmland in England. Whereas which, that- by the way, the, the House of Lords is still the most British thing you have ever seen in your <laughs> yeah. life. I've, I got to visit and watch. I got the, the – what do they call it? The Fifth Estate? The sixth, it's a it's a right that they had to get to to be able to watch Parliament in action, and I got to sit and watch Parliament, and every single one of those people is so incredibly <laughs> thoroughly British. Like they, when something they agree, they agree with something, they bang their canes on the floor and say, "Yeah, yeah, rah, 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 rah. They get up and be like, oh, "I think if she's going to reference the study, she should put it on the table for all of us to reference." <laughs> and they'd be like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah," and then the. The speaker of the house was a lady, and she would put glasses on to read from the paper, glasses off to talk to the House of Lords, glasses on to read, glasses off. So I think that was – that wasn't the House of Lords. I think the House of Lords is still private. I think this was Parliament. It's, there there but, are two but, So Parliament bodies. came out of the House of Lords. It used to be the Lords that were in the House of Lords, and then it became an elected position. Got it. But anyway, but so – No, there's still – isn't there still a non-elected body, governing body? There's there's Parliament, and I th- then I think there's the House of Lords. I think but these they don't two have, different I don't think they have things. much. Anyway, I don't know enough about it. But anyway, uh, the idea being that um, that you used to have thousands of monastery owning small tracts of lands, and right. now you have like forty lords owning all the land, and um, and then they were able to. There was sort of this tipping point where you could never sort of um, get that power back. Anyway, so what, so would it, would, would it work out as like stronger anti-monopoly laws? Like if you get above yes. so a, very, a smaller size, you get broken up. That would be a very distributist idea. Uh, and also a very distributist idea would be a co-ops or people owning shares of the companies that they work in. Yeah. So there's a really great company that put out a book called, oh shoot, uh, they're called Basecamp. They do uh, project management yeah. tools and they wrote a book called Rework. Rework is a really good book. And they talk about how they don't want to get so big. So big. Yep. Um, and really is, uh, they don't, they would, they would, they don't self-identify, but really what the, the model that they've put forward is a distributist style company yeah. where everyone has a huge stake in the company. It's small enough that you know everybody. So you, you're not making these decisions on the faceless masses, but you're like, you know, instead of saying, are we going to liquidate this department? We're like, should we fire Kevin? You know, like yeah. it's, or yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, I, is, Kevin is, is the worst. worst. Anyway. So yeah, distributism is really fascinating. Um, uh, but chal- you know, it's, there's ch- big challenges in the modern economy so to, as well. So to recap for those who are 
because I started recording in the midst of this conversation, you are arguing against capitalism as a eventual modern slavery. No, it's more that Hilaire also, Belloc's... Also, Graham is an pos- anarchist. I'm not. Burn- I'm not at oh, all. Sorry. It's more that Hilaire Belloc's thesis is that capitalism is a transitionary system. That's, all, that's Marx's argument, too, is that capitalism precedes... Yeah, and, and Marx said the only solution is that we put it into a strong centralized state, right. and Hilaire Belloc and G.K. Chesterton were flatly mm-hmm. against that, and they said, no, we need to distribute the means of production as much as possible to as many people as possible. Right. It's also fun- Sorry, it's just funny that you said, so Chesterton liked it when the monasteries owned um, the tracts of land, and it could be um, worked on then. Marx preferred what came immediately after that, which you said distributors don't like. Marx liked that um, there was a set production that each person had to do and then once you met that production level you were done mm-hmm. as opposed to the current model which is like a, a, an hour of work that you do every week so you will reach 40 hours or whatever how many hours you work regardless of your output as opposed to the older model that was once Com- you complete a task complete and a task, then you're, you're done, done. Mm-hmm. yeah and i guess there's some yeah. return to that now it's kind of a popular thing to talk about um doing your work and not worrying about hours but i don't know yeah it's fascinating yeah. i feel um, like that's that's our current teaching model or at least mine i have I have, I mean, there's, there's something to be said for hours. I have to spend so many in the classroom and that's what Mm -hmm. I'm paid for, but I have teaching tasks and if I work hard, I can get those done early. And if I'm a slacker and don't grade my tests for three weeks, I get in trouble. Personal experience? Is that, that sounds a little Uh, too real. The Gilgamesh test is still, (laughs) still out there. I, that's how I'm spending the rest of today. Awesome. All right. We should probably, uh, do a real topic. Let's go ahead and actually start the podcast. So welcome. If you want to borrow a serve all state, you can. I do. Yeah. Welcome, audience, to Classical Stuff You Should Know. This is a little unconventional since I dropped you guys into the middle of a conversation that we were previously happening or previously having. Just a little glimpse into what we do when the microphones aren't on. <laughs> uh, so today we will be discussing a topic. Oh, sorry. Let's, let's re- talk about who we are. Mm. I'm A.J. Hannenberg. I teach ninth grade English and 12th grade English and co-teach rhetoric with my next co-host here. I'm Graham Donaldson, and I teach 10th grade English, 12th grade English, senior thesis with AJ, and I am the dean of the glorious house of St. Francis, and we're here also joined with... Thomas Magby. I'm the dean of student life for the high school. I teach discipleship for the 8th graders, uh, leadership for the high schoolers, and then um, I guess unless this is put out after the first trimester, I I direct one of the one-act plays. He's also thing to know about Magby is that one of the ways he got this job mm. is he came and he was hanging out with my brother-in-law, Troy, who's also our principal, and he's like, you know what I wish? <laughs> I wish there was a school that was set up to teach the classics <laughs> in this certain c- format, and they would focus on the old books, and thing. And Troy is like, you know that that's like that's that the school that I run. He, that's he, my he job. Thought, he thought I was messing with him. Like He thought that I'd looked up what he does and was just describing it back to him, but no, I mean, I... I We'll actually talk about this in the next podcast, which, whatever, after Graham's, but uh, on me discovering the classics and work of Mortimer Adler and stuff. But yeah, that's how I came to it. Cool. Yeah. So he described our school before he actually started <laughs> working at our school. Yeah. So he just slotted right in here. Nice, <laughs> nice and right easy. In. Yeah, fits right in. So today's topic, gentlemen, what we're going to be talking about are the different appeals that you make when you are trying to convince somebody of something. So if you are giving a speech or what our students do at Veritas, they give a thesis and the thesis is a deliberative discourse where they are telling the audience or describing to the audience a decision that they need to make or they're making a proposal that we are weighing in our minds. They are deliberating about something. And there are different ways, uh, there are different sort of sides of the human person that you need to appeal to if you are going to win them over. Um, And so the three uh, uh, appeals that we're going to be talking about today are the things that we call in the thesis department the OSES because it is the appeal to the ethical man or appeal to ethics and the ethos. Uh, It is the appeal to emotions and appeal to the feels, and that is the the pathos, and then the appeal to logic and reason, and that is logos. Now, if those three things sound familiar in regards to how uh, the human soul is made up. You may refer back to our platonic tripartite soul podcast where we said the human soul is made up of the rational sense, the spirited sense, and the appetitive sense. And yes, those three appeals really do slot into those to those sides of the soul with logos the, being logos being rational, um, ethos being the spirited sense, and then or the will, the will, 
and then the uh, appetitive sense with the emotions because right. the emotions are things that are stirred and moved. They're not, they're not created through willpower or they're not derived from reason. Anyway, so we're going to talk about these three senses and – Usually we've been breaking these podcasts up where there's sort of one person driving the ship and other people are, are giving color commentary. But Hamburg knows a whole lot about the Oses, as, and I'm also learning a lot about the Oses in thesis class. So we're going to be jumping back and forth in between of the two of us. But what we're going to start... And then Megby is just I'll, I'll make funny flower. comments. He's and then Megby will make here funny to comments. hang out. Waka waka. <laughs> I'm here for the pretty face, so thanks. So what we're going to start radio. With, On radio. On radio. <laughs> you got a face for radio, Megby. <laughs> Um, what we're going to start with is logos, the appeal to reason. Now, in a perfect world, in deliberative discourse, the appeal to reason should be the th- the only thing. It should be the thing that people that we, the only thing that we talk about. It's, um, um, I don't know that that's true. That it's in a perfect world. I mean, I, I think f- it's easy for us moderns to think that yeah. logos is desirable above the other two, and that we should be driven only by our logic. But I think that's an enlightenment ideal, and that's not a fair point not appealing to the whole person, right? We are not just logical machines. That's not how people are built. I took that exact sentence from our classical rhetoric for the modern students, so maybe they which are. What are you is, teaching to these students? Which is a very dry... Oh, I think it's hilarious. It's, it's, I mean, it's a funny book, but mm-hmm. man, that thing maybe, is just not intentionally paint funny. drying on a page. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so let's, let's read. Yeah, so I'll take that back. I so, mean, I'm just kidding. That book, if you are listening best. to this so podcast, it is, it is We have an entire reviews. shelf of them, and we love it. <laughs> um, but so the appeal to logos is perhaps the first thing we think about when we think about convincing somebody to do something. Um, uh, and this is how we argue and reason and how we talk about things. We use exposition and argument to, to come to conclusions. If something doesn't make logical sense, no matter how much of an emotion that it, uh, that it evokes and stirs, or no matter how much willpower we can throw into something, if it doesn't make logical sense uh, and it and it doesn't have logical connections, uh, it's not going to land for the audience, and it may it's probably going to be a bad idea to to go about and do things. Well, you can convince people without it. There is a convince if you feel strongly about something and you think it is the right thing to do. If you even if you haven't completely thought it through, you can take action. Yes. But if we want to appeal to the whole person, yes, and specifically what is typically regarded as the highest faculty of the person, logos should be one of the focuses of this. That's one of my favorite uh, thoughts about the Platonic soul and the appeals is that all throughout the ancient world, there's this tug of war between which is the highest sense. Is it the logos and the reason, or is it the ethos and the spirited soul? All of most of the poets say it's the spirited soul. Most of the philosophers say that it's the rational soul, which makes but sense. Philosophers love to say that the highest end of man is, <laughs> is philosophy. Is philosophy. Yeah. Uh, almost every single philosopher has been like, you know what's really great for people? <laughs> the thing I do. Philosophy. You know who should be in charge are the philosophers. Thanks, yeah. Aristotle. Yeah, Aristotle. Um, wasn't he? No, Plato was the I'm philosopher, the philosopher king. king. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, the poets say, you, Bard, are the <laughs> true hero of this story. You who can who can evoke. Uh, uh, willpower and the emotions. Homer even wrote exactly. himself into the Odyssey as this character and had Odysseus, his main character, who is a very logical centered man, come up and say, I respect you more than <laughs> any man alive. You and your beautiful stories. Bards are the best. Yep. Um, so Logos, these, these expositions and arguments that we create, and we spend a lot of time getting students to write arguments and to have logical flows of their essays... These, oftentimes, these things turn on definition. You need to define your terms. We need to be talking about the same thing. We need to not be talking past each other about definition. And we, we should have you refer back to an earlier podcast on the common topics, where right. definition is one of the common, the common topics. Um, well, and all the other common topics also come into this, yes. right? You are going to use testimony. You're going to use good sources. You're going to use results, talk uh, consequences of how things happen, cause and effect. All of these things are going to come into play when we talk about logos. Exactly. And so just as a fast little recap, definition has uh, – the uh, you divide things into – you can talk about the genus, the things that they are under – or the categories that they fall under. And then you can talk about division, what makes up a specific thing. So if you're trying to define honor, you can say, well, honor is a virtue. That's the genus. And you can say, well, what makes up honor? And then you can talk about the various different parts of honor. 
And the one thing that you can use in, to help to, uh, define something is you can give examples. And this is the big thing that we do in essays. An example is one piece of a, of a definition. You want to know what honesty is? Let me tell you what honesty is, and then you can tell a story about an honest man and say, that was honesty. Um, uh, an example. So today we were at the market, my wife and I, and I went and I bought bacon from our pig farmer. Well done. And um, uh, he, he said, all right, it's nine fifty, uh, And so I paid with my card, and then I went off with my bacon. Uh, oh, it's the best bacon in the world. <laughs> oh, I just got to think about that for a second. And then my wife looked at... You should ask the farmer to tell you stories about the pig that you're eating. Did oh, he live, did he's he live like, a happy life? Oh, he is. Was he a well-cared for He's pig? a great farmer. He's like... He's got a thick old Texas accent. He's like, this pig just had one bad day. <laughs> and I was like, all right, okay. cool. Uh, one bad day. Uh, it's not very Texas. And that gave you one, uh, good, yeah, one, good, one day. good day. Many A great week. <laughs> anyway, so my wife, she's looking at her phone, and she said, hey, he only charged us six fifty. Uh, six and nine are next to each other. He did the, on his cell phone, he punched it in. And, he already, and so she's like, you know, we should go give, give him his three bucks. And I was like, yeah, totally. So we went back. He was a little surprised to see us, and we said, hey, you undercharged us. Here's three bucks. And he said, well, thanks for being honest. And as we left, I was like, honesty is a virtue. It feels yeah. pretty good to be honest. But that's an example. My wife was honest. So I could use that as an example to talk about the definition of honesty. Um, the other way that you can define things is you can describe it. So uh, instead of just one example, a series of examples, you can give synonyms. Uh, honesty is like this. And you can say uh, well, that, something wouldn't that wouldn't that it be is the common like, topic of similarity? Yes, and then the yeah. Co- yeah. So, you, so the common topics are these great ways to to get to. Um, if you are a master at the common topics, you will come across as the logical speaker. The appeal to logos will land on to your audience because. As you speak, they'll say, yeah, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. Right? And I think part of the reason for that is that the common topics altogether are an exhaustive way of thinking about any subject, right? You can't really think about anything without thinking about it within the confines of the common topics. If you think about what exactly is something, you're thinking of definition. Mm-hmm. What's it like? You're thinking of similarity. Mm-hmm. What are the possible consequences of this course of action? You know, you're thinking of relationship. All of Almost any way that you can think about something is within the common topics. So saying that if you're a master of the common topics, you're a master of logos, that's just saying, well, you're a very clear and thorough thinker. Exactly. Right? And, and that means, you know, good good thinking, good argument. And but, the, oh, go ahead. Was, so then are there other common topics that fall under ethos and pathos, or do all the common topics fall under logos? Yeah, so the, all of these things work together. Okay. Logos, pathos, and ethos all work together. So, for example, even when I gave the story of my wife being honest, um, yes, I was giving you the definition of honesty, but there was some pathos in there because I was having you contemplate a honest action, and it maybe made you feel good. And you may think to, th- think to yourself, like, wow, Amanda is an honest person, and you, know, and you sort of felt like, you, it stirred an emotion with you. And we'll talk about that. So yeah, all of these things, they work, they do work together, but I don't know if there are specific common topics where it's like, if you really want to go After with the- ethos, you should do definition. No, I don't, I, think, I don't so. think the common topics are specific. In mm-hmm. fact, you can evoke a logical similarity between two things, but you can also give similarities between two things to arouse emotion. You can say this tyrant, mm he is like this other tyrant that you hate, right? Yep. And and you thereby... Yeah, you can define them in a way that would bring out pathos or ethos. Yeah, mm-hmm. you can say that the this event that has happened recently, it is a tragedy, yeah. and thereby incurring a little bit of emotional content to your words, right? So all of, like I said, the common topics are an exhaustive way of thinking about any subject, and so they, they naturally involve pathos and ethos as well as logos. The other ways that you appeal to logos... Um, is or the ways that you can not come across as an idiot, um, <laughs> which is important. Is, which is really right. important yeah. when yeah. you're speaking uh, to anybody or you're trying to convince anybody of something is to avoid logical fallacies. And this may even be its own podcast because there are we have a sheet of like 36 or so logical fallacies that we teach to students, and 
we we play presidential fallacy bingo where we watch presidential debates and then and we have them mark off the fallacies when they find them and then the first one to get a bingo gets a special prize a special prize and they so, have to tell us where they were and what the argument was and give us the time and why it was a fallacy yeah. and ad hominem is just off the charts ad hominem and red herring are the oh, two that are well, most often red used herring in is debate. like well thank you for that question on tax reform and to answer that question I want to talk about the war on terrorism. <laughs> It's like, ah, oh, so. Or, yeah. or, I mean, that's super blatant red herring. Sure. Or even talking about something that's loosely related. Yeah. Like, they're, they're asking about maybe taxation on property. And you're like, well, that brings me to my platform on tax reform in general and fewer taxes for everyone. And you, they use it as a gateway into an unrelated topic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So these, these fallacies are myriad and spread. And you can, if you would like, you can email our email address, classicalstuffveritasacademy.net. And I will send you my compilation of these fallacies, and I can even give you examples if you're curious. But that, like I said, that's he's right. That's a whole other podcast. But as we said, they are the bread and butter of political discourse as it currently sits, and they can be used spuriously to manipulate an audience that can't recognize them very well because right? they do work, they work. Kind of, they're like little shots in the arm that can get you through a debate. But at the end. It's like a sugar rush. You're like, wait a minute, that actually doesn't really mean anything. I feel duped. They don't stand up. They don't stand to up. good scrutiny, mm-hmm. and scrutiny will pull them to pieces. And if it happens during the debate, you will come across as a fool, right? If if someone calls you on it and you say that, well, that brings up my thing on tax reform. Let's talk about fewer taxes for everyone. And the other person says, wait, he asked you a specific question, and it seems like you're dog- dodging the question. You look devious. And so we encourage our students not to argue spuriously, even though you can use fallacies to manipulate. It is unethical, but not only is it unethical, but it leaves you vulnerable to argument that makes your fallacies cave like a house of cards. That's right. If you have a logical fallacy and you use it and people are like, oh, that's clever. I guess I've never thought about it that way. And then one person stands up and shows you how this is just a logical fallacy. Your logos is gone. You are no longer seen as uh, a logical uh, thinker because you didn't see this mistake that this other person saw. And of course, you're going to take a big hit on your ethos because people are going to feel like you're pulling a fast one on them. Right. And uh, let's let's give them an example. Uh, so, ad, ad hominem is a fallacy in which instead of okay. attacking an argument, you attack the person giving the argument. And so maybe a spokesman stands up and says, smoking is incredibly bad for you. It does these horrible things to your lungs. And then another person stands up and says, well, I've heard that you like to kick dogs. Is that true? Why should should we believe a dog kicker? Right. That's it. Doesn't have anything to do with the actual argument. It's still true that cigarettes are harmful for you. Mm-hmm. But he's trying to deflect, and this happens a lot during presidential debates. Instead yeah. of attacking the argument, they will attack the arguer, the other candidate. That's mudslinging, right? When you get down in the trenches. Another example would be the genetic fallacy, where I may, as an advertiser, choose a spoke person, spokesperson that has certain qualities. I can think of one instance where they had. Clint Eastwood as a representative for a Republican commercial. Yeah. And they were hoping that the qualities we associate with Clint Eastwood, right, Americanness, Westernness, Great. gritty, hard work, and right, shooting bad guys. Shooting bad guys, that all of these qualities would be transferred onto the candidate. And in this case, it was actually a slur. It was an anti Obama ad. And so it was a it was a double whammy on this one that yeah. the they were attacking Obama rather than his policies. And they were hoping that the qualities we associate with Clint Eastwood would rub off on the rub off on, on the message on the on the message. And the funny thing is, we're not even associating like the qualities with Clint Eastwood. We're associating it with his characters. Clint Eastwood, the actual person, is an actor, right? right? Mm-hmm. He's probably mm-hmm. very different than we imagine him to be. He spends his time eating salads and talking about roles and reading scripts. He's not the kind of down home working person we imagine yeah and so these things cave pretty easily i could stand up and say now mr clint how much time have you actually spent in a field and he would say well beyond movies probably very little so they they cave really easily Mm -hmm. to To scrutiny to scrutiny and so we encourage our students to avoid them and we try to point them out in papers when our students write that way but aren't those mm -hmm. but that fallacy is that the question Does like, that call the entire advertising industry into question? No, Why, not, yes, that's, it that's does. That's not my line of question. My oh. degree is in marketing. This is awkward. My, um, it, how is that different than, aren't ethos and pathos then emotional manipulation that the logical fallacies are bad forms of it, but don't they do the same thing? So, uh, not unless they are um, um, having you feel the right things about the about 
about right right things. Yeah, feel rightly about right <laughs> yeah. yeah sure so we're we're not quite there yet yeah. okay. uh, sorry, we can sorry. we can appropriate a, we'll talk about appropriate emotional manipulation when we <laughs> okay. when we get yes. there i'm wondering if we want to split this up into three oh, we've already spent quite a while on the logos and yeah. maybe we can do it i mean okay. we also threw in a random extra conversation at the beginning of this one do we want to split it up into three sure we can cut out that first part yeah but it's so good it <laughs> Um, so, and if j- we did cut it out, now they're hearing us talk about cutting out this first part, and they're just thoroughly confused. <laughs> Makes for good radio. So let's go back to logos. Okay. So with logos, yes. Yeah, so logical fallacies are things that we don't want students to use, or if you use, it is like eating your seed corn. Like you, it may get you through the winter, but you're dead. You're. Um, uh, and then the last thing with logos is just pure syllogisms. Like you need to know how to do logical syllogisms to be able to um, say appropriate conclusions about subjects. So all men are rational. AJ is a man. Therefore, AJ is rational. That is a syllogism. And this is what we spend a lot of time doing in the school of logic. So middle school. Um, and this is just those those building block foundational argumentative skills that you need to have. And it's you, the simplest form of argument where you have two premises and a conclusion. And arguments can get more complicated where mm-hmm. they have any number of premises. Uh, and that, that's the thing you will eventually learn if you become a programmer because programmers use logic as their basic language. That's what computers use is logic. And so eventually you can have far more premises, but the most basic form is a syllogism. Two premises, one conclusion. Mm-hmm. I have nothing more to say about logos. I, I would say we move on to ethos and we can we keep going. Okay, so maybe we just advise our listeners to if you need to take a break, <laughs> go, go ahead it. and you yeah. just take a break. Just pause us. Yeah, we'll just put us on pause. Back. We'll come back. This we'll is, still be here. We're not going anywhere. Yeah, the internet is magical. Yeah, you magical can listen place. to this whenever you want to. So go and have some coffee. So whatever, we'll get there eventually. But my main takeaway from that is that logos like uh, makes things clearer. Like it tells me what you're actually talking about. So. Logos kind of sounds like the best one right now. It's the here's how here's how this makes sense. Okay. This is where we as a people love to think that we live. Mm-hmm. We we only yes. only we only rational. tackle problems mm-hmm. that makes absolute logical sense, and it's completely logical, and that's how we function, right? And I think, yeah, like I said, I think that's a an enlightenment ideal, and it, and it's honestly been an ideal for a long time. We think reason is the highest end of man, and so we like to think that we are only motivated by reason, but that's not. Not true. That's not true. And if you're going to convince someone of something, you need to use the other two appeals. The other two appeals, the next one we're we're talking about is ethos. And this is the appeal to ethics. This is the appeal to uh, the question that we need to ask yourself is, did I come across as a good man? Where if someone is on stage saying something, is the audience saying like, man, I want that guy to like me, or I want to be associated with that person because they're a good person morally upstanding person yeah well the ethical appeal is a two-pronged approach so one prong is the you need to come across as an ethical person in general and an ethical being that has the best interest of your audience in mind and then not only that but you need to be able to use that platform to argue ethically we should save the children not for any logical reason but because it is it is right it is the right thing to do Mm -hmm. that's an ethical appeal this is a really important one in deliberative discourse um, in other kinds of discourses, it's not as important. So take, for example... Deliberative meaning planning something that is, will come in the future. Yes, that we are deliberating between, between what, we should be, or, but what we should do next. But when you're talking about judicial discourse, uh, it is a little bit less important. So th- take, for example, a defense attorney. He is needing to focus on the law and whether his client broke the law or did not break the law. It is less important whether or not we think the defense attorney is a good man. We need to see him as somebody that is following the law. So we often have the association of the defense attorney as like kind of a slime bag because he can get people out of out of uh, 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 consequences. But the best the best attorneys will be the ones who convince the jury that they are an ethical person, it's and true. that not only are they ethical, but they're. The person they're defending is a good man, one who has maybe either made a slight mistake and shouldn't suffer so much for it, or someone who is being maligned and has shown a good record of good behavior. And so the the ethical appeal is still important here, even in discourse where the question is stuff that happened in the past. And so you you will still appeal to the the ethical position of not only yourself and your defendant, but 
talk about the action itself and the the good notions and ethical standing of the jury. You are all good people, and you can make a choice about what was right and wrong here. But but justice needs to be blind, and, and the jury can't just make decisions based on whether or not they think the defense attorney is a good man or not. The reality is is that they probably are, um, and and attorneys will will realize this. But um, ne- neglected, the ethical appeal can mean that your jury thinks you are slimy and your defendant is slimy mm-hmm. and will not want to acquit. Yeah. Anyway, ethical appeal. So um, the thing about the ethical appeal is, and Aristotle talks about this, he says, if you want to come across as an ethical man, you need to be a good man. This is incredibly hard to fake. It is very difficult to fake being good. The ethos is the easiest thing to lose in an instant. One off-color joke, one eye roll at the wrong position, one uh, 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 misplaced um, facial gesture. A spineless comment. A spineless comment. Even standing in the wrong posture can send a certain message to your audience. Your whole ethos can crumble in an instant. So this it's it's very difficult. So dropping a swear word, yeah. a racial slur, all of these things are quick ways to lose your to ethos. To lose your ethos. Um, yeah, so the, it is something that can be lost incredibly incredibly quick. And so the best way to safeguard against it is to actually be the good man. Because if you're trying to fake it, there are you just need to fake a thousand and a thousand things. Um, and you need to be overly analyzing, wait a minute, if I do this, am I going to come across as slime bag? So if I, maybe if I do this, I can come across as a little bit nicer. Um, that is a recipe for making you a madman. You just need, but if you are the good man, uh, it, these things, it will come out of you naturally. And so the, the appeal to ethos will actually land. Um, there are tools or there are exercises that you can do to improve your ethos and improve the way that you come across on stage. And if you are the ethical man, one that we teach the students and that I really like is if the individual is, um, can understand different contexts and different conditions of different people in life. So if you can understand the difference between the elderly, the young, the sick, the rich, the poor, the uneducated, the educated, if you can understand the differences between those things uh, that does a lot to improve your ethos. So, for example, we have a student thinking about doing a top uh, a senior thesis on military conscription. We should have everybody be uh, um, spend time in the army. And if he did the argument, and it could be a logical argument, he could say there are no free passes in America. Everybody has to be in the army up until they're 80 years old uh, because then we can maximize the amount of people that are lifting sandbags and are rebuilding after hurricanes and all these kinds of things or whatever. Could be a logical argument. But his ethos takes a hit because as soon as someone says, well, my grandfather, just 75, got a hip replacement. Are you going to be having him slinging sandbags? My son, who has cancer, uh, is sick and bedridden. Are you going to force him to be in the army? Um, The speaker hasn't considered these different kinds of conditions, and he ends up looking cold, which is what only logos can end up doing is you can look sort of cold and calculating and that you haven't considered the good of of society it it also helps other other ethos things to show that you are sort of well read and and maybe that's not the right word for it in in this season of the world there are a lot of people who don't read a lot and aren't necessarily well read but that you are professional expert that you are thoroughly informed in the subject you're talking about, and maybe you're with it. Like, you understand what's going on in common culture, you understand what's going on in pop culture, and there's there's where some people can, can miss. And also that you don't argue spuriously, and here's where ethos and logos intersect. If I've been using logical fallacies and an audience member realizes it, I look dirty, and that's going to kill my ethos, even with just that one single member. And I can think of an instance where... I read an article by a headmaster in another public, pub, another private school, and he was maligning the Harry Potter series. And aside from how you feel about that series, he said, we don't let our kids read Harry Potter. They shouldn't. That, that book has, you know, witches and magic and evil and murder. Our kids will read only the classics, such, such as Shakespeare. 
And I was no like, witches and murder. Yeah, exactly. This guy has clearly never touched a Shakespeare play because that that's the bread and butter, right? That it's all ghosts and murder and witches and so all of these things. Let's go read the Tempest. So <laughs> right there, his ethos was shattered because he was not an expert in the subject that he was talking about. Right? He didn't fully understand the things that he was saying, and your ethos is lost. So you must be an expert. You must argue without spurious fallacies. You have to have the best interest of your audience in mind. All of these things work together to give you a good ethos. And then the last one is pathos. And pathos is the appeal to the emotions. And this is the one that gets people uncomfortable because it is normal that we are moved by our emotions. We are. We are moved by your emotions. But we don't like thinking we are. Or we don't we want to feel like, or we feel like somehow being moved by your emotions is a lower thing, and I'm a man of reason, and I only look at cold, hard facts, and that's how I decide how to navigate it's, this world. It's probably because we see the emotions as sort of an animal thing, yeah. right? They are, and even when we, you think about the tripartite soul, emotions are something we have in common with the animals. Mm -hmm. And so reason being unique to the human person, we see that as where we should live, right? Because that we, we should, have reason and we should make our decisions that, it should that be the way. only thing that we appeal to to make our decisions. Yeah. Uh, but that's like what, what supervillains say in, in movies, right? Like uh, they're the ones that are, they're supervillains because all they are is just logos. There are plenty of logical evil people. That's right. Um, so pathos. So it is normal, but people don't like thinking about it. But when you press them on it, they realize that when they have been moved to emotions in, in appropriate circumstances, it is a good thing. They're not ashamed of it. They're not ashamed of it. When you fell in love, you were moved by your emotion. And are you, are you ashamed of having fallen in love? Nope. No. Especially if that person is now your spouse. Yes. Right? If you fell in love and they were worthy of your love, maybe they were your kid, mm -hmm. then there's no way. That's an appropriate emotion at the appropriate time. If you were moved to pity in an, ab in an actual pitiful situation, somebody's circumstances were that they moved your soul to pity and you did something to help alleviate the suffering. And you look back on that, you are not ashamed of that because that was the appropriate emotion in that instance. Yeah, if you save a homeless animal, right, that may be a stray animal and you bring them in and you take care of them and you fix them up and now they're a part of your home, your pity has helped the world, right? You would never be ashamed of being moved to pity and, in that instance. And it may not even have been the logical thing to do. The dog mm. could have rabies. The dog could be vicious. Um, but you were moved by your, by your pity. So when you are appealing... To, the path, to pathos, this has to be an indirect thing. You cannot announce it. You cannot say, now Buckle that up to yeah, be sad, Now everybody. that I've <laughs> given you my argument, let's talk about all you, for all you feelers out there, let me just say, you can't announce it because people are going to cross their arms, tilt their head, and not listen to you. Be like, well, I'm above ap appeals to my emotions. So what you need to do is it needs to be an indirect attack. Like all good military strategies, the indirect attack works. Now that doesn't mean you're doing something evil exactly. or underhanded. Yep. You are ideally, this is what we teach our students, you are appealing to an appropriate emotion for an appropriate position, right? You want to make them angry about something that honestly should make them angry. It's an injustice and they should feel appropriate anger about this. And so you are going to bring that out of them, but it's not underhanded. So you cannot announce, you cannot say, you know what you should feel? You should feel angry about this. You can say it, and we hear that all the time, and I think that's like a really good, or not a really good, it's, it's something that coaches often do in sporting events, like, get mad, kids, go hit somebody on the football field. That doesn't work as much as what you need to do in order to stir the appropriate emotion is to have them contemplate something that stirs the emotion. So... Uh, the fantastic example of this is Mark Antony in Julius Caesar. Mm. When he is trying to get the crowds upset about the murder of Caesar, he doesn't say, get mad, you guys, they killed Caesar. Or he doesn't say, those guys who killed Caesar are just the worst, absolute terrible people. Um, Which we'd have to take him on his word for it. We'd have to take him on his word, and that, that's not going to stir the emotions mo as much as what he actually did. He went and he showed them Caesar, who was draped with a cloak. His, his own cloak. His he own had cloak. pulled it over his head as he was being as attacked. As he was being attacked. And uh, uh, Mark Antony pointed to all the holes in the cloak where the knife had gone in and was pointing, was making reference to the men who made those holes in the cloak 
uh, there's a metaphor where Brutus is knocking at the door with his knife and it is answered with Caesar's blood or yeah, something like that. Yeah, he says, like here's, here's the rent that the beloved Brutus made, who you all know was Caesar's greatest friend. And look how the blood flowed out of doors to see whether Brutus so unkindly knocked or no. Right? He stabbed and the, it was like the blood was curious, like, yes, what do you, what do you need, Brutus? Mm-hmm. And, and it, yes. So as he has these people contemplate something that should uh, arouse their anger, it does. And then at the end, he says, if you have felt this way about Caesar's vestments, how would you feel about seeing the actual body of Caesar? And then he shows the body, and they're like, we gotta go do something. And not only that, but prior to even showing them the holes, he says, look at this cloak. I remember the day I gave it to him. Mm. It was the day he overcame the Nervii, who was this army he was fighting against. And so he reminds the audience of Caesar's previous victories and that he is a human person, that he receives gifts, that he is the kind of man that is a friend to Antony. And then he reminds the people as he points out the holes that the men that made these holes in the garment were Caesar's friends, even some of his best friends. And so the crowd among, as they feel sad and feel this the pain of this tragedy, their, their anger is roused because mm-hmm. of the betrayal that has happened. So what you do to appeal to emotions is you have them contemplate the object that it stirs. And as a speaker, as a person who's doing this, you can actually do it somewhat dispassionately. You yourself don't need to get all worked up into a froth. It can help if you do. It can definitely help, but it can also hurt. But if you, if you have them contemplate something that is, is appropriately stirring the emotions and they feel it, it will rouse them to action much more than anything. Um, and so... Uh, and then, then this is sort of the interesting part of all of these appeals is that we can know the right thing to do with Logos. We can have the capacity to act. We can have the willpower to do something with our spirited soul. Uh, we can know the good, ethos. But unless our passions are stirred and unless we want to do the thing, we won't, we won't do it. And this is where the appetitive soul actually is a, uh, a really important part of the human person. Now, we've said that we often dismiss it because we consider it the animal part, because animals also feel emotions. But in many ways, the appetitive soul is the thing that needs to be worked for action to actually happen. Yeah, you can know something is good, but you won't do it unless you actually want it. Mm-hmm. You, have to, you have to feel something about it before you actually take the action. So, so emotions are things that are beyond our control. Um, they are uh, my favorite metaphor for the emotions in Shakespeare is they're like weather. They're like a storm. Uh, your soul can whip up into a storm. Um, and when Plato is talking about justice of the soul or justice, he says it's our soul is like a city. And I was thinking about this before this podcast um, for an action to happen. Um, if the rational part is like the head of the city and the spirited part is like the, the, the soldiers, the soldiers of the city. And then the appetitive part are like the citizens Mm -hmm. and the workers. If the citizens are upset about injustice, they make their they make their feelings known to the head and the head has to decide whether or not their feelings are appropriate or not. And when they decide that their feelings are appropriate, they can put give the orders to the soldiers to actually go and and make the change or, or distribute justice and however they see fit. But the head is never going to do it unless the emotions or unless the appetitive side of the soul signals to the head that it needs to decide, it needs to adjudicate between these feelings. Or the head can say, I, I know something that would be good for the city, but if everyone but in the, the city like, hates nope. this idea, mm-hmm. right? If, you're, if your emotions revolt against the concept, you're not going to take the action. So to get people to do stuff in deliberative discourse, you really need to stir the emotion for that thing to get done. And, and you do that by showing consequences or, or by showing things that actually appropriately stir and by, these emotions. by using narrative, in mm-hmm. all honesty. And this is what's super interesting to me is that the Bible itself could just be a list of rules, right? It could be Jesus come, came down, believe in him equals salvation. Uh, do good things in family. Be kind. It could just be a list of these rules. And many religious texts are, right? They're just sayings. But and many times we reduce the gospel to just uh, a, a, um, a sort of soul calculus, which believe heaven, which is so damaging. And what God has done in writing the scripture is given us narratives that we can apply to our lives. Right? He gave us David so we can see what happens when you when you lust and then you do something you deeply regret and how God reacts to somebody who follows and is a man after his own heart and then makes one really big mistake. We can look to Samson when we're 
being silly and we make a lot of mistakes. He, he was kind of a messed up guy, but we can look at each of these narratives. We can look at Jesus as he interacts with the people on earth. We can look at Peter as he is headstrong and tries real hard, but man, that guy just makes a lot of mistakes. And we can see ourselves in these things and they should rouse our emotions. And it's so easy to suck the emotion from scripture. But yeah. really, that's one of the reasons it's a narrative is that our whole human person is applied, appealed to. One of my favorite things in Scripture is the change of Peter from what the man we have in the Gospels to the man who has written First and Second Peter. It's a very different person, uh, or the man that you see filled with the Spirit in the New Testament, mm. in, in the in the Acts, in the book, the Acts of the Apostles. Um, and so, when I think about that, I think in, in many ways the Holy Spirit, the presence of God dwelling in the hearts of believers, is something that also helps to balance the the soul, the logos, pathos, and ethos, that these things can work in harmony so that uh, the real work that we ought to be doing, which is that of proclaiming the gospel and bringing the kingdom, can be done effectively. Um, I know that, you know, we as, as student life director, you know that souls, that people are not moved by logic alone. Right. I did not become a Christian because of, of a logical syllogism. Yeah. Um, or because someone told me that it was like the good thing to do. At some point, your heart needs to be moved. Uh, you're ap- you, you need to, to contemplate and have your, your soul stirred to have your, your emotions, mm-hmm. your feels in the proper, uh, uh, yeah, so that, so that, to so contemplate the so good. You're tying, so you tie ethos, pathos, logos to the will, appetitive, and rational parts of the soul. Mm-hmm. So then can you learn something about a person? Like, does that mean then that a person should be moti- like they should be persuaded by logos and ethos and pathos? Absolutely. Or, or mm-hmm. there's something wrong with the wrong maybe the wrong word, but wrong with the soul. The, yeah, the Stoics said. I think they get a bad rap, right? We think of the Stoics as these clean, no emotion, yeah. no emotion people, but that's not that was not what the doctrine of the Stoics was. They said you should have the appropriate amount of emotion at the exact appropriate time, and that when your emotions are out of out of sync, you should rule them, right? You, your, mm-hmm. your logic should sort of put them down. And I think that's a healthier way to think about it. For, for a long time growing up, I, I saw myself as a purely logical being and tried and saw that as something worth chasing after. And as I've gone further in my life, I've realized that that's not at all healthy, right? I should feel things, but only at the, in the appropriate amount at the appropriate time. And that's what a good speaker does is he brings his audience to feel the appropriate emotion at the appropriate time. And there's all three of these work together. And if you're giving a discourse or giving an argument, you need to think about where you need to make the most overt appeals to these. And we tell our students that the beginning is where you make the most overt appeals to ethos, right? You need to establish yourself as a good, trustworthy, worthwhile speaker at the very beginning. Because if you don't have that arms are crossed and they're like, well, why am I listening to this snot bag? Like, why am I listening to this person that doesn't know what they're, that, that's like not a good person. And they'll, and they'll tone out, tune out. And so you need to use the appropriate level of diction. And this is where you use the florid or high style. You use language meant to impress, yeah. right? Big vocabulary, the kind of, where you don't use verbal fillers, where you stand up straight and you don't put your hands in your pockets and you're conscious of what, conscious of what your hands are doing. All of these things go to establish you as a good person. Jokes. And then once you've, yeah, jokes and is, stories and, Jokes is ethos. I mean, uh, a a well-timed joke that lands, everyone wants to be that guy's friend. Yeah, they're like, he gets us, and he gets me, and he's funny, and they like you. Mm -hmm. And then you can move on to logos, and you convince your audience, because you can't really... Sometimes it's good to stir the emotions and then show them that something is possible, like make them desire it and then show them it's possible. But more often, you show them something is possible and then stir them to movement with the emotions. So it goes ethos, and then you spend some time in logos in the middle. That's where logos mostly happens. And then your most overt appeals to emotion usually happen near the end, where you say, I have now convinced you. You believe me that this is possible or that it is good. Now let me show you why you want it. Mm-hmm. Let, me, let me show you why you should desire this thing. Get them fired up. Make it, make, you know, give them pity, give them sorrow, give them anger, give them whatever is necessary for them to move. And of, all three do exist in the entirety of your speech, right? You can crack jokes in the middle while you're ta- talking about logic. There can be emotional stories in there. But that's where the most overt overtures happen is ethos at the beginning, logos in the middle, pathos Pathos. at the end, usually. But they can switch around depending on your topic, right? If you want to move your audience and it's something that should be pretty easy to convince them of, maybe you just want to go straight to moving their emotion, get them fired up, and then show them it's possible. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess what makes me nervous about ethos and pathos compared to logos is that 
So, and he says it was phrased, come across as ethical. And you all are talking about the person should be ethical. But there's this book by a guy named um, Robert Cialdini, I think it's called Persuasion. And it's a study of um, modern cults and how cults keep people in their ranks, even though they involve like giving them all your money or killing yourself mm-hmm. or crazy things like that. And so then he takes lessons from that and says that this is how cults do it. This is how we should also persuade people. And it's not be a good person, be logical, um, um, cause people to have appropriate emotions. It's more like wear a suit because that will make you appeal like an ethical person because people trust people in suits. Like it, it's more about the appearance of it than it is about the person itself. But, but you're all the classical method. Is but more. all of those are lost in an instant as soon yep. as as soon as the dressing is revealed to be what it actually really is, which is just window dressing. Yep. Like, do those things help? Yes. Yep. If you are an ethical person, if you do all those things, is your is your ethical person going to be amplified for sure? But you can't fake it if the, if the core is rotten. Right. And there are ethical people who are bad at coming as a cro- yes. across as ethical. Mm-hmm. They they can't speak in public very well they don't wear the appropriate clothing they slouch all of these things send the wrong message to their audience about who they are and so they can be trained uh, and we that's what we do for our students is they're typically ethical people and we need to help them re- reveal that to the audience in this case it's more about the me- the message in the medium rather than the source yeah. and you can like i think that there are plenty of programs out there that are designed to help unethical people appear, appear ethical and i think that's called sales mm. <laughs> Right? Like that whole pickup artist subgenre yeah. of the internet is like he, we can te- teach men how to, for an instant, like appeal like a good mate, and then they can just try to pick up girls in a bar. There's like whole industries based on taking taking rhetorical practices and subverting them to some sort of end, and what we call that is like evil <laughs> like, or Be, what that is is, is yeah. we call that because, is wrong but that's because of the end of it not yes, because right. of the practice because of the okay. end of yeah, it. yeah the, the practice of appealing to the emotions can be good and it can be bad right i can abuse my audience and make them feel inappropriate emotions about inappropriate things or i can help them to feel the correct thing at the right time yeah. i can use logic i can abuse the fallacies and dupe my audience into doing things i or i can help them to clearly think through a problem as their advocate. Same with the ethos. I can actually be good and then they see that clearly or I can be evil and try to cover that up. So that's the that's why where rhetoric gets its bad name right. is because because we are training in these things, you can abuse these skills, but it's it's the double-sided coin of any set of skills, right? If I'm if I'm good with a knife, I can use it to prepare Thanksgiving dinner or really mess somebody up, right? Yep. It's it's a double-sided coin. I'm sold. I'm sorry. Y'all cool. convinced me. Yeah. Excellent. I'm sold. Last thing I want to say about uh, the OSIS is that um, you can think about the individual person who has an excess or a deficiency in each of these things, and that comes across in their personality. So somebody who has um, an excess of pathos or someone for whom pathos is the sole driver of the ship is going to be somebody that all of their desires moves them no matter what. They don't think. They don't think. Yeah. Somebody for whom... Um, the spirited soul or the ethos is the only driver of their decisions is going to be somebody that just, I don't care what it is. I just want to go. Let's just go. Let's just do something. Let's just get out. Let's just go. Why are we sitting around? Let's just go. Yeah. I think the feeler would be a person we would say is licentious. Yes. Right? They, licentious. They, they, they give license to things. They are, they like to feel stuff. And, and then, then the, the willing person is somebody that's foolhardy. They're a lightning rod, right? They yeah. get fired up. They get fired up. They, we just got to go do something. And then the logical person for whom only logic they are appealed to would be, you think of like the wizard in the tower, or you think of the, the detached, the cold, cold. Um, unfeeling, unethical, um, um, cold hard facts. Basically what everyone thinks about academia. Yeah. Which is so unfortunate. Yeah. But it's true in a lot of senses. Yeah. Um, so the whole point of a balanced soul is that all three of these things can be working in harmony, that you that you can use these things, that you can um, train them to, to, instead of these three horses trying to pull in their own direction, you can um, harness these three horses together and have them work together to move the chariot forward, to steal a phrase from, from Plato. But how do you... Okay, so pathos is appropriate emotional response at the appropriate time. Um, and then you just said direct in the right way. How do I know the right level of ethos, pathos, and logos? Like, I don't know. It's a skill. Okay. 
it, just like anything else, you can really overdo it on one. And that's, that's where Graham and I are here to help our students think through it, right? If they're really laying the emotion on too thick, it can feel saccharine or no, no, I'm saying the other side, not just the way that they present, but like if I feel, so you all just gave the examples of an excess in any one of the three. But, um, if I'm a super, if ethos is the thing that motivates me a lot and pathos and logos don't like, how do I know the right amount of ethos to be motivated by? Like, I don't, yeah. Yeah. Uh, wisdom and discernment, mm-hmm. like age okay. experience. I think those are the easy answers. I, I wonder if reading the classics is some way of saying like um, Odysseus was mo- was great in this and bad in this, so be like Odysseus. Yeah, the analyzing of characters and asking why did they do yep. this, should they have done this, are these sort of honing and tempering exercises because the implicit question is always what should we have done the same right. thing, what would you have done? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can have the students walk through the decisions without having to live the consequences of the decisions because we're doing it in a classroom. So like any good English teachers, we've brought this back <laughs> to books. <laughs> Congratulations, yes. gentlemen. All right, I think we should stop it there. This one has been real long. We it's really are shot the mark here. So I hope you've enjoyed it. We will be back next week with even more. And this has been Classical Stuff You Should Know. Again, if you have questions or comments, you can send them to classicalstuff at veritasacademy.net. This is AJ, Graham, and Meg signing off. Bye. Bye. Bye.